speaking about Western man and his choices, I should like to begin to speak about the question of choice, which in a way is also the question of freedom. Does anyone have the choice to decide between life and death, peace and war? And to what extent does man have the freedom to make such decision? Man as an individual and we as a Western society. I should like to make a few points which seem to me in need of some clarification. <clears throat> the first point is a good deal of the discussion on freedom is conducted in terms of has man freedom or does man not have freedom? I think this question of freedom or not freedom, as if freedom was a given substance, something which man or do, has or does not have, uh, is only apt to confuse a problem. I would say freedom is not a fixed quality somebody has or doesn't have, but it is a faculty which depends on man's total development, just as wisdom is a faculty which depends on man's development or in fact our capacity to speech, to speak. Let me give you a simple example. If two people play chess, they start out with complete freedom to win. The freedom is equal on both sides. After a few moves, there's already a difference. The possibilities for the one to win are greater than for the others. But still, the one whose moves have not been have been uh, less good than the opponents, has still a chance to win. From there on, there is a process in which at one point, there is no more freedom for one to win and no more chance for the other to lose. The difference is only that the good chess player knows when he has lost the game, a few moves ahead of losing his king. The poor chess player goes to the end and he has to see how his king disappears and then he's convinced he has lost. Now, if you take the move in the chess play between the first move and that move in which the good chess player knows the game is lost, you see a development of decreasing, decreasing freedom, of decreasing possibility of choice from the moment where there is full freedom to the moment where there is no more choice. Let me mention um, an example from a rather unknown book, the Old Testament, uh, where when the Old Testament tells about the story of the liberation of the Hebrews from Egypt, it is said that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, I don't think that means that God wanted Pharaoh to get harder and harder, but it simply means in the process of doing evil, uh, uh, any person's heart hardens. There is a point where we could still decide. After a while, we can decide no more because our heart has hardened enough by our actions. And again, this is an example for the process of either gaining or losing freedom in the development of one's whole personality. I think we are in the same position today. I believe we have still time to choose life and peace, but certainly the margin of our freedom has narrowed down considerably, and it may not be many years from now that there is no more choice and no more freedom in this. The second point I wanted to make is a question of predictability. Those who speak of determinism in history often mean that a certain outcome is predetermined, there is no other way, hence there is also no freedom. This is often presented, especially by the Soviet so-called Marxist, as Marxist theory of history, which is in fact a misrepresentation. I think the problem of freedom and history, of determination and determinism in history, is not that we can assume there is one cause which will by necessity produce a certain outcome but that we should rather say what is determined are alternatives. That both in individual life and in historical life of the human race, of a society, what is determined are certain ascertainable alternatives which are limited in scope. 
In other words, it is not just one outcome which is determined, but there is also not an unlimited choice of events which can happen, but there are various ascertainable alternatives, one, two or three, two or three or sometimes maybe four, and also these alternatives have their conditions which are ascertainable, and in fact it is the task of the science of man or of the science of society to investigate which are the conditions which lead to various alternatives and hence also which are the conditions which could lead to choosing the one as against the other. A third problem referring to choice and freedom is one which is very much discussed in the last 30, 40 years of Western history, and that is getting stuck in the choice between two evils. Usually people see an alternative between the bigger evil and the smaller evil. They think all they can do is to choose between the two evils and logically think if they choose the lesser evil that's better than to choose the bigger evil. What happens in individual and in political life is usually that this only means to postpone the arrival of the bigger evil for a while, but it arrives with all the more certainty. In order to make the point uh, clearer, I should like to tell you a North American Indian legend which deals with the question how the Grand Canyon was created. The story is briefly of a young man who uh, had the outrageous and criminal idea of not marrying within his own tribe but to marry a girl from another tribe. His elder thought he was either crazy or criminal, so did the elders of a, girl, of a tribe where he saw a girl with whom he fell in love and she fell in love with him. So they decided to kill him and he declared he would come back to marry her. Uh, the girl, when she heard that, sent messengers to tell him he shouldn't return, but of course he did. But he was clever enough to ask the messengers, at what point precisely do they want to kill me? And they told him. So when he came, a minute before the point when they were going to kill him, he took the girl, put her on his horse, and they rode off. But after a while they saw that the men from the village pursued them. They had fresh horses. There were many. They got closer and closer. And at this point, the girl said to the boy, look here, if we go on riding, this will lead only to death because the more we ride, the further we ride, the closer they come. There's no sense in continuing what we are doing. Let us do something else. The boy said, more intelligently than most uh, men, let us say, act. All right, what can we do? <laughs> and she said, let us get down from our horses and pray to the gods. And the boy said, again astonishingly, let's do that. And they got down from their horses, they prayed to the gods. There was a big storm and darkness. And when the storm and the darkness disappeared, the Grand Canyon was between them and their pursuers. Well, this is a very poetic uh, legend of humanism, but I'm not mentioning it for this reason primarily, but for another reason. The girl refused to accept uh, doing something which definitely did not make sense and which would only postpone the final catastrophe. And she has the imagination to see that if something does not lead to anywhere except destruction, it doesn't make sense to continue it. And it is still more realistic and more rational to say, let us see whether there is not an o another possibility. This other possibility in this case is to pray to the gods. Now, we, pray, we pride ourselves of praying to God all the time, but I think we have very little confidence that this has any use in comparison with our realism of continuing the arms race. We go on with the arms race in a kind of naive optimism, thinking maybe in this way eventually we can avoid war. What I mean to say is that one of the great dangers in making choices is to be stuck in cliché alternatives in continuing actions or 
uh, direction which cannot lead to anything but destruction and not to see that there may always be another possibility. And this possibility is the possibility which in this legend is expressed as prayer to the God, the possibility of humanity, the possibility of the voice of truth, the possibility, if you please, of Christian behavior. Eventually, I want to mention a fourth point concerning the question of choice and freedom. And that is the strange thing which happens in human life so often, in individual life, you can observe it every day with yourself or with your friends, but also in political life and in historical life. And that is that man's greatest mistake in living seems to be our inability to know when we make a crucial choice. Our inability to know when we are at the crossroads. We all know that man has fantastic emergency powers of energy, skill, imagination. When he is confronted with a clear awareness that here is the matter of to be or not to be, a matter of life and death. People have shown, and we can observe it, remarkable and un, uh, uh, remarkable gifts which nobody would have thought of of imagination and energy once they recognized it was a matter of life and death. We see that with every one of us in a critical situation driving a car that we do things which we usually couldn't do. But if you think of thousands and hundreds of thousands of refugees who having lost their money, being driven from their home, have done the most remarkable things, have shown the most remarkable energy and imaginativeness, we see not only that we usually live far below our potential of energy and imaginativeness and skill, but also that we can mobilize it once we see the clear choice. Now, what leads most of us into a situation which, or to the failure in our lives, is that when it is not a clear-cut situation of life and death, we see decisions in a fractionated way. We see only a little step here, a little step here, a little step here. And when we recognize that the first step led in this direction, it is already too late. Our heart is already hardened. We have already lost the chess game. The great, one of the greatest questions in individual and political life is, to acquire the ability to see that one little step may be the beginning of a course of action which eventually will not be reversible anymore. And to recognize when such a step is made. In case we do that, then I believe a person would be able to develop those very emergency powers I have spoken of and be able to really change his course of life. He then has still the freedom of action, still the energy and skill to go a different way. But what we do with ourselves and what usually the leaders of a society do with their people is to be encouraging by actually making them believe that things are all right, that everything goes well and hence to, pre hence to prevent them to mobilize that emergency energy which we have for the purpose of changing our life or changing the fate of society. I believe that our choice today is a choice which we can still make although we have lost a great deal of our initiative, namely that is the choice of a new humanism or barbarism.